welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Akiko Fujita along with Josh Lipton. You may notice a few different things. Number one, new anchor, right? I That's mean, you've right. been joining us for a week now. This is the first time on the desk. Yeah, and back here, Akiko, at the New York Stock Exchange, which as you know, it's kind of like a, a homecoming because I used, to, I used to be here a lot as a reporter. Um, always love the heritage, the history, and people should know the traders down here, very solid group as well. They keep yeah, you laughing exactly. from the open to the close. So we've got a bit of a homecoming. We're also going to be coming from here for the next several months or so as we upgrade our own facilities, our own studio here. But a lot to talk about today. I guess, anything you want to let us know about you? I mean, about me, wow. <laughs> Well, Kiko, we, you actually, on the spot. we have California in common. People should know we that. Do. Southern California, here, Northern I California. Moved out that way, I, guess. I know. It's interesting because I usually surprise people by saying I'm a Bay Area guy because they, they tend to think I have kind of a, a tri state vibe, which I've always chosen to take as a compliment. I don't know. You, you know. Yeah, I was surprised to learn that you're from the Bay Area, but you got your roots here. You're coming back to your roots here at the New York Stock Exchange? It feels good, it feels right. All right, let's start with the market check as we always do. Uh, taking a look at where the majors are right now, we've got one hour left to go in the trading day. The Dow up 12 points, the S&P 500 up one, and the NASDAQ down 10, the S&P 500 trying to uh, snap a two week losing streak there. Taking a look at the sectors today, energy seeing the biggest gains on the day. Uh, also that big call from Citi that uh, oil could be breaching $100 dollars a barrel, at least in the short term. We're going to get to that and much more in just a bit. But first, let's talk about our top story of the day, the UAW, United Auto Workers Strike against General Motors, Ford and Stellantis has entered its fourth day, showing no signs of slowing down. Following last week's comments by President Joe Biden, calling on major car makers to improve their offer to workers, UAW President Sean Fain saying, he doesn't see a role for the Biden administration in bringing an end to the strike and that he expects actions and not just words from the president. We are on day four, Josh. Uh, it certainly doesn't feel like we're any closer to reaching a deal. The big three essentially offering what amounts to about a 20 percent increase in pay over four and a half years. The UAW asking for something closer to 40 percent. And that's just the beginning of the divide. Yeah, I think you brought up, you know, UAW chief Sean Fain. I think, Akiko, when you listen to him today talking to reporters, it really seemed like that divide is still wide. He was talking very aggressively, ambitiously. I think you kind of heard this tone of frustration with him. So on wages, on hours, there still seems to be this divide there. Interesting, too, the way I think the Biden administration coming in, as you mentioned, you know, Biden considers himself pro-union, pro-labor right. I think he's kind of expressed this sort of solidarity with the workers, kind of talking about how, listen, big profit should mean big contracts. So I think to your point, it's a good one. As he gets more involved, the Biden administration gets more involved. How does that play out? Is, is that helpful? Is that hurtful? Is that just optics? We'll see. Well, also, I mean, in many ways, there is the, the business story, of course, we're following, but there's also a political element to this because this is a president that has put so much on labor. At the same time, he wants to advance this green agenda, which requires this rapid transition to electric vehicles. That's been at the heart of the concerns that UAW workers, Sean Fain, representing all of them, have really expressed to. Acting uh, Labor Secretary Julie Su being sent there to really be a part of the discussions. I think that's what makes Sean Fain's discussions today interesting to say, you know, we're not sure there's a role for the White House to be had right now. Yeah, and you, and you mentioned this. It, it, period of transition that this is all coming as well as these big three begin this transition to EVs, electric vehicles, away from gas powered autos. How does this play into that dynamic? It is such a historic moment for these companies. I think a lot of investors, maybe they look at all this drama, all this turmoil, these players, the UAW, the big three really going after each other hard and publicly. Some investors might be thinking, can they really work through this transition together? Yeah, and worth um, pointing to some numbers that we got out from Goldman today, talking about the impact this is likely to have on the big three. It talks about implied lost revenue of GM and Ford, roughly 100 to 125 million per week for each company. We're just in day four, but you see the stock reaction at least today um, as we get an update on where negotiations are. Uh, Ford down at more than 2%, GM down as well as Stellantis. Now, negotiations have continued today between the UAW and the car makers, and as yet, there's been no resolution in sight. The union leader, Sean Fain, today warning uh, that they are going to amp up the strike 
action. Threatening to hold picket lines at more sites is part of their selective strategy. Currently, the walkouts have taken place at three locations, Missouri, Ohio, and Michigan. But where will the UAW hit next? That's the big question we're asking today. Let's bring in Kevin Roberts, Director of Industry Insights and Analytics at Car Gurus. Um, set things up for us right now, where things stand, Kevin. We're talking about three plants. Where's the next step you think UAW is looking at that could really amp up the pressure on the big three? So the UAW is attempting a new strategy uh, this time around and doing a stand up strike. Uh, so they're kind of keeping some, you know, uncertainty out there. Um, so I would say we don't really know where they're going to strike next. Uh, we don't know when it could be. Um, but I do want to mention that while we do know the three plants that have already been struck, we're already starting to see some trickle down effects. And GM's already come out and said that one of their plants is additionally going to be impacted by the uh, plant that's already been struck. Uh, so we're already starting to see some trickle down effects uh, from the strategies that UAW is employing. And Kevin, just to double tap on that on that strategy, because you bring up a point, it, it's different, right? They're not going after one company. They're kind of going after different, all three companies here with these targeted strikes. Talk about why, why they adopted that strategy. What's the point of that, Kevin? Is it just to keep the big three kind of on their toes and uncertain about where they could be hit next? Yeah, I, I think it's it's meant to kind of keep that uncertainty on the OEMs and try to keep the, them at the negotiating table and try to get a better offer for the UAW. Um, Kevin, uh, there's you know questions about what the ripple effects are going to be, you know, sort of beyond where things stand right now. There's some reporting out of CNBC that points to potential for 18 facilities that be could be closed um, from Stellantis. I mean, is that part of sort of a, a negotiating tactic, if you will, with the company saying, look, we understand what you're looking for, but there are effects that could come out of that. Yeah, there's definitely effects that have gone that can come down uh, down the road. I kind of see three real paths that they could really uh, take on this front. Uh, one is they can target the vehicles that have the or vehicle plants that have the least uh, availability of vehicles right now. We're already starting to see that with some of the plants that were targeted. Uh, Ford Ranger and uh, GMC uh, Canyon already have some pretty light day supply of inventory. And so we're already starting to see inventory levels for those vehicles start to decline a little bit more quickly. Uh, conversely, they could go for the vehicles that have the highest profit margins, um, but those vehicles tend to have more kind of day supply or inventory out in the marketplace. And the third kind of option is you could go towards the powertrain plants where they produce the engine transmissions and kind of get kind of a wider impact um, out into the marketplace by targeting just those plants. And Kevin, it's, it's really an interesting moment where this is all unfolding, right? Because you have these big three, the industry, they're making this transition to EVs, electric vehicles, away from gas powered cars. Just talk about the moment here and how perhaps this UAW strike, how it complicates that picture for these companies going forward. Yeah, I mean, you've already heard uh, a lot of the automakers come out and say that the transition to EVs is going to be expensive and they're trying to really uh, improve the profitability of the electric vehicles out there. Obviously, if you're increasing your labor costs, it's going to potentially reduce some of those profit margins out there for the automakers, and that's going to create some issues out there. Conversely, uh, you know, you're going to have a decent number of U.S. built vehicles that aren't built at UAW plants that could potentially have lower profit margins, have higher profit margins out there because they have lower uh, labor costs out there, or could provide the automakers opportunities to reduce the price of those vehicles uh, to be a little bit more competitive in the marketplace. So Kevin, on that point, I mean, how should we be thinking about the beneficiaries? We've heard Tesla being thrown out a lot, but obviously a lot of the Ford car makers do produce here in the U.S. and they're a non-union, they use non-union labor, non-union markets. Um, you know, which one of those names are you watching closely that you could see potential inroads being made the longer this strike continues? So I think most automakers who aren't impacted right now, so basically not Detroit three automakers, stand to potentially benefit in the marketplace. We, you know, we're coming out of a situation where we're still, the industry is still recovering from the semiconductor shortage. New vehicle prices are up significantly higher than what they were from a pre-COVID level. The availability of vehicles is much less than it was, say in 2019, the last time there was a strike. And so, you know, if you have vehicles available on lots, it really creates an opportunity um, to take advantage of that. And additionally, in our latest consumer survey, 73% of shoppers reported 
being open to several brands. And so again, you know, if a vehicle is not available or you're gonna have difficulty ordering that vehicle, it really presents an opportunity for other automakers to take advantage. And Kevin, finally I want to talk to you about the Biden administration here and their role. You know, obviously President Biden, he considers himself pro-labor, he's pro-union, he's talked very openly about how big uh, corporate profits, he says, should mean big corporate contracts. They're involved here. To what extent do you think the Biden administration can help break this stalemate? You know, I, I can't really speak to political strategy, but I think considering the impact a prolonged strike could have on inflation levels and local economies, it's safe to say the situation stands to extend beyond the auto industry, and the quicker we can resolve this situation, the better. Kevin Roberts, Director of Industry Insights and Analytics at Car Gurus. Uh, good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. Thank you. And markets look for gains after two losing weeks as investors look ahead to the Fed's policy decision this week. Here to break down the latest market action, let's get to Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery. Jared. Hi, Josh. Let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive. We got that big Fed meeting on deck this week. I am looking at volatility and specifically the VIX. Interesting uh, price action over the last couple days. This is a two-month chart, but I just want everybody to focus on the last two days. We actually hit a low, lowest day of the year, only Friday, and we have bounced back up. Now, in as much as VIX is a non-trending asset, it is a mean reverting asset, uh, you would expect it to go up and then down again. In fact, over uh, the entire period uh, that we can calculate the VIX going back to 1990, we do find some rather large spikes. But for the most part, we camp out in the lower end here. And uh, in September and October, we actually do have a rising VIX. We do have a lot of market crashes in history that cause the averages to rise. And here I want to show you what usually happens uh, over the year in the VIX. That would be the cyan line. And you can see the purple line here is what's happened this year. They closely, pretty closely track each other, including that big spike in March. Uh, we've had some other calamities in the, Mar in the March era before. Uh, you think back to 2020, the pandemic. But nevertheless, I'm focused on what's happening right now. And here's where we are. Here's where the VIX uh, is relative to what it usually does. And then mid-October, it's usually much higher. So we could see a spike in the VIX. It spike in the VIX. What would that come as? Well, the big catalyst this week would probably be the Fed meeting, uh, but it could be any number of one of critical uh, economic reports regarding inflation or the non-farm payrolls report, which we'll get in a few weeks. Not to get too far ahead of ourselves, I also want to check out the volatility in the bond market. Um, the 10-year has been screaming higher, and it's threatening to make new 15-year highs. Here's the 10-year T-note yield going back all the way to 1990 as well. And you can see how it's broken to the upside here. But I want to leave with the move index because, and this is like the VIX of the bond market. You can see we are actually on the way down there, not the lowest levels of the year. Here's the year to date where you see testing those February lows, but heading lower nonetheless. So stocks heading high, excuse me, the stocks VIX heading higher and the uh, bonds VIX heading lower. We'll have to see how it resolves itself. But the potential the potential for a market downturn has increased over the next couple of weeks, guys. All right. Love seeing this many Yahoo Finance reporters at the New York Stock Exchange. Jared, you thank bet. you, sir. Let's check in on some trending tickers. Shares of Tesla down today as Goldman Sachs lower their profit forecast for the EV maker amid slowing demand and the ongoing UAW strike. Goldman slightly cut their 2023 estimates by 10 cents, going from $3 to $2.90 and their expectations for 2024 from $4, 425 to 415. Um, Josh, you know, this is interesting because it, it feels like there's a bit of a debate that's happening in the street. You know, yes, the concerns are there about the price cuts. Most recently, Tesla, at least in the U.S., cut the price for the S and the X. We were talking to RBC Capital's Tom Narayan last week or a few weeks ago who said, look, it doesn't matter if the pricing is lower because they'll get more units there and they offset. It feels like Goldman is saying something different here, saying it's going to affect Tesla, at least in the short term. Yeah, it's interesting because, listen, Elon Musk hasn't been shy about the strategy, right? He's chasing volume. Um, so he's been very upfront about that. I also thought, Akiko, it was just interesting to see this note because so much of the chatter about, about analysts and investors right now, we were just talking UAW, it's all about how at least some on the street think it's Musk and Tesla's moment, that they are sitting pretty, they're a winner, there's going to be some type of deal between the UAW and the big three. It's going to mean higher labor expenses, and that's going to be good news for Elon Musk. We'll see.
Yeah, I guess, you know, based on what we heard from uh, the analyst or our guest earlier, too, you know, that's sort of oversimplifying what's happening right now because it, yes, it's about EVs, yes, yep. it's about pricing, but there's other uh, issues at play here in the UAW strike. So something to be watching. But uh, another stock we're watching today, DoorDash. Yeah, so shares of DoorDash trending higher this afternoon. That's after being upgraded by Mizuho Securities to buy from neutral. Analyst James Lee pointing to continued growth in the company's gross order value that he expects to exceed second half expectations. Price target for DoorDash was also raised to 105 from 90. So interesting, Kiko, DoorDash ripped higher this year. But this analyst is saying, listen, it is still, despite that rip, attractively valued. He thinks the value just is not baking in potential growth here. We were looking at numbers before. What is the stock up more than 60% yeah, year to date? Uh, I mean, they have seen huge gains so far this year. This is sort of separate from what we saw last week on, on the downgrade on DoorDash, specifically talking about how the impact from the student loan payments resuming could affect DoorDash because of where their key user base is between 25 and 44 years. That That's sort of the discretionary spending that could really be affected. But um, we're still contributing to Dash, right? Yeah, the I mean, Lipton family <laughs> are huge DoorDash customers. Too much DoorDash. I mean, try to cut back, but every week the four-year-old gets in your way, and then all of a sudden it's yeah. just so easy to tap It's the dinner. kids. Yeah. It's the kids that make I you just open up the app yeah, and always say... always blame the four-year-old. But those yeah. fees are, they're pretty steep. Rough. Yeah, they're rough if you yeah. go. All right, well, we're still contributing to DoorDash. Let's talk about another stock that we've been watching over the last few days, shares of Arm Holdings, the latest IPO darling, hitting a speed bump to start its first full week. Bernstein initiated coverage on Monday with an underperform rating, saying it was too early to say that Arm will be an AI winner. Analyst Sarah Russo set the price target for Arm at $46 a share. Uh, that's sort of similar to what we heard from Needham analyst Charles Shee last week, who said, look, it's already, the valuation is already too high, but also investors are putting too much into the fact that this next big bet for Arm is going to pay off. Yes, it's a very, very established company within the mobile space, but AI is a whole nother bet, and that hasn't necessarily been proven out. At least that's what we're hearing from these analysts. Yeah, I mean, listen, I mean, you talk about Arm, Akiko, and you know this because it is one of the most important semiconductor companies on the planet, full stop. Um, I think you did hear those these concerns when they made their public debut about valuation. Some folks said, listen, by some metrics, it's looking kind of stretched. And secondly, to your point, when you talk about Arm, you still associate, of course, with the smartphone market. We know that's slowing, and that has had an impact on Arm's financials. We did, though, at Yahoo Finance just last week, talk to Arm's CEO. We asked him about that, and we said, listen, is that smartphone market, is that still going to be a growth driver for this company? He said yes, while pointing out they are diversifying into data center and autos, but some investors say, listen, show me first. Exactly. But, yep. you know, the, the interesting thing to watch this week as well, though, will be how that debut last week is going to feed into the enthusiasm when IPOs, obviously Instacart's going to trade tomorrow. Yep. We saw them increase their price range as well. You know, will that tech momentum continue as is expected coming through from the ARM uh, debut? Something we'll be watching all For week. sure. And we're just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, the IPO market is finally gaining some steam, as Akiko was just saying, with Instacart set to debut on the NASDAQ tomorrow. Despite all the hype, our next guest has a hot take. She says SPACs are the more attractive way to go public. Hear her argument next. And pain at the pump, gas prices just hit a 2023 high and breaking down the impact on consumers across the country. And later, the best just keep getting better, at least according to the one and only Dan Howley. He'll give us his detailed review of Apple's new AirPods Pro.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. Let's do a quick check of the market sponsored by Tasty Trade. Uh, we are seeing a bit of a split picture. The Nasdaq pretty flat right now. Uh, the S&P 500 also trading flat and the Dow up 14 points here with uh, just about 45 minutes left to go in the trading day. Also taking a look at the VIX, the fear gauge. We don't have the VIX. No. This is the magic, magic of live. You go, this <laughs> magic is of live TV. <laughs> there there you go. It is up uh, about 2.3% right now, 1411. All right, switching gears. It's an investment trend that a lot of investors, bankers, and entrepreneurs became big fans of. SPACs, or special purpose acquisition companies, are shell companies with no operations. Their sole purpose is to raise capital to acquire an existing private company and bring it to the public markets. So how does this process work? Well, SPACs are commonly formed by managers with expertise in a particular industry or sector. SPACs raise money by selling units. Each unit typically makes up, up one share, and these shares trade like stocks. So investors in the SPAC can buy and sell shares. The money from the sale of shares goes into a trust, and from there, managers have up to two years to acquire a private company. If a SPAC can't make an acquisition in time, the SPAC is dissolved and investors get their money back. If the SPAC is able to acquire a private company and the deal gets approved, the business co businesses combine into a publicly traded company. So why go public through a SPAC deal? Well, it's typically faster than the conventional IPO process. There's less scrutiny and private companies get access to expertise from SPAC sponsors who are typically knowledgeable in that industry or market. What are the risks of a SPAC, though, you have to consider? Well, deals can fall through, of course, and like any investment, attractive returns are not guaranteed. In fact, according to SPAC research, shares of the roughly 400 companies that went public through SPACs since 2000 have fallen more than 55% on average. 55%, that is a steep drop. Well, it's a big week in the world of IPOs. Instacart expected to price its IPO later today ahead of its Tuesday debut on the NASDAQ. The latest estimate is between $28 and $30 a share. And marketing automation company Clavio raising its expected price range today to $27 to $29 a share ahead of its Wednesday debut on the New York Stock Exchange. Year to date, there have been 84 traditional IPOs, 22 SPAC deals, that's at least according to Dealogic. This comes after Arm's highly anticipated IPO last week. Shares, though, currently down significantly, more than 7% there today. For more on the IPO space, we turn to Isabel Friedheim, founder and chairwoman of Athena. That's a woman-led SPAC that successfully merged with renewable energy tech company uh, Heliogen in 2021. Great to talk to you today. Um, what is the case for SPACs? I have to say that's a pretty surprising take when you consider the performance of SPACs so far. Josh, just walk us through the numbers. Doesn't look good. So make no mistake, the IPO window continues to be largely shut and IPO returns have been somewhat similar tracking with SPAC returns. Three years ago in 2020 and 2021, well north of 400 IPOs that raised 170 billion versus a fraction of that today. Uh, you mentioned it earlier, 84 year to date. Um, the uh, opportunity for a window opening is going to be predicated on the comfort and clarity around the core issues that are prolonging this shut window. And that includes fears of recession, inflation, political divisiveness, and so on. Um, but notwithstanding headwinds, the better companies can go public through an IPO, but it's rare. We saw it with Arm, Instacart, and those companies can access the public equity markets, which is, again, the largest pool of capital in the world. But those companies are still subject to all the forces of the current investor mindsets, which are downside protection, risk aversion, and a decline in equity investments. And that's why SPACs continue to offer an alternative to going public via an IPO, uh, because there is a path to going when there's otherwise a line of other companies waiting. And remember that we've already seen around 100 SPAC deals announced this year, 100 uh, that have closed last year. So the SPAC market continues to be active, but of course the valuations have to be in line with markets. Well, I guess that's the key. I mean, what we have seen from SPAC, past SPAC performances, and we're talking the last several years, is simply that it, it hasn't bared out in terms of the case that these companies have made. Uh, the, the perception appears to be that companies who don't have 
uh, the fundamentals in place are opting to go public through a SPAC. So what has fundamentally changed? Yeah, I mean, the, that's, uh, you know, the market, could, the equities market, the equity markets continue to be difficult. And when you look at SPACs, the SPACs that successfully combined with companies are those that have extraordinary value added and that are not just shells. So that's why we've done at Athena. We prepared for this moment in time and built a platform with management, boards, advisors that have centuries of experience, entrepreneurs, CEOs, Fortune 50 board members, so that when we take a company public, they don't just secure a conduit to becoming a publicly traded company, rather they also acquire management experience and a network with providers and structured expertise that can enhance the value of the company once they do go public. And Isabel though, just to kind of emphasize Akiko's point, when people think, investors think of SPACs at this point, I do wonder you know, how many for them, it's kind of tarnished as, as an investment. I, I think a lot of people might think instantly they go to Lucid or they go to digital world acquisition. When you're making this case to SPACs, to investors who maybe are a little skeptical, how do you get over that hurdle at this point? Well, I, IPOs haven't performed any better, right? <laughs> um, but it really depends on the sector. I mean, I think SPACs offer the flexibility to look into different sectors. So for example, you look at AI um, and a, a lot of companies offer an attractive investment thesis for investors. AI is a moment in time with respect to innovation. And just as with we saw with the internet, there's a universe of opportunities and, and imperatives in corporate America that creates an opportunity for an investment. And you know, investors that today don't want to miss on the opportunity for AI types of returns uh, can access those through newer companies that are going public via SPAC or others. Uh, but it can be difficult to identify which existing businesses will most successfully capture this opportunity. And, and here's something to note, for many, it will depend on the scale of the existing business that you invest in. I think that will dictate the value of the opportunity. So in, in other words, investors can get more concentrated exposure and diversification across the existing client base by building portfolios of companies that have already invested in AI. So with that said, what does the pipeline look like for SPACs going into year end? Um, I think there will continue to be a number of announcements. We've, of course, we are seeing encouraging signs with some IPOs, but again, the, the window remains shut for the time being. And we're looking at, uh, on our end at Athena, have partnered with a lot of ESG companies that continue to offer also attractive business models and that do use AI. Um, we have, for example, an electric EV company coming to market soon. And uh, this is a company that's very different than other EV companies that have recently gone public because it has strong fundamentals. And that's what we focus on, fundamentals. It's one of few companies that are able to actually produce cars and deliver them within a short period of time. It has a factory that's already built and it's manufacturing cars, a hardworking management team with a track record of driving growth and profitability and uh, yet low cost. And that's gonna be really important as the next phase in the EV markets. Athena founder and chairwoman Isabel Friedman, it's good to talk to you today. I uh, appreciate you stopping by. Thank you. Well, coming up after the break, higher for longer or a pause on the horizon. The expectation is the Fed will leave rates unchanged this week. But what do investors need to know for the rest of 2023? We'll explain on the other side. We'll be right back.
Markets are roughly flat today as Wall Street is turning its focus to this week's Federal Reserve meeting where Fed Chair Jerome Powell and the central bank will issue its latest interest rate decision. September's meeting comes following new economic data that showed easing core inflation in a cooling labor market. For more on what to expect from the Fed, let's welcome in Kevin Flanagan, the Wisdom Tree Head of Fixed Income Strategy. Kevin, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Kevin, you are the perfect man to talk to right now. Listen, this week, as we know, investors all focus on the Fed. What do you expect, uh, Kevin? You expect them to pause again? Walk us through what you think we'll hear from our policymakers. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think it's pretty much a given at this point that the Fed will pause. If, if you know, there's been a lot of criticism on the transitory front and all that going back a year and a half or so ago. But one thing I will give Powell and company credit for is they have guided the markets pretty well up to now. Remember, I mean, in the rate hike cycle, we went from 25 to 50 to 75 and then back down to 25. So, I, you know, with the markets pretty much 99 percent probability they're not going to go, I don't think the Fed's going to upset the apple cart. Two key things to watch, though, is going to be any change in the wording in the policy statement. Do they begin to make that guidance or shift that there's not a, a continued rate hike cycle coming we're at or close to the end of it and the other is going to be watching i think the dot plots what is the fed thinking about for 2024 because i think we're quickly going to turn the calendar to 2024 after this meeting kevin i guess that's the question here you know no real surprise is expected this week but what happens after that do you see another rate hike on the horizon this year, what is the latest economic data we've gotten so far that seems to point to some reacceleration coming from energy prices, but core inflation holding pretty steady? What does that tell you about where the Fed should move? It's a great question. You know, I mean, I remember my Econ 101 class when I when I could make it to 8.30 a.m. in the morning, that class um, back in college. <laughs> you know, we were always told that energy was inflationary, but I think the Fed would also view the tax on the consumer, that aspect of it as well. So I'm not really sure if we get higher inflation readings based upon higher energy prices, the Fed would move. I, you know, they talk about the totality of the data. And I think you'll hear that again from Powell at the press conference. But to me, it's more the labor markets. That always goes to the front of the line. And if we see the employment reports continue to come in as they have, could the Fed raise rates one more time before year end? I think you have to leave that possibility open. But back to what I said before, I think the bottom line is we're at or close to the end. Then what? What comes after that is going to be, I think, how the market should be thinking as we turn the calendar of the fourth quarter and into next year. Well, that's what I want to ask you, Kevin. So the then what? What do you think does if it, if there's a pause now and then it's kind of a toss of what investors think. Maybe they maybe they go another 25 basis points. What do you think, though, Kevin, investors are just as interested in when they start cutting? What do you think it'll take yeah. for Jerome Powell and, the, and our central bankers to start cutting? What do they need to see? Is it core inflation? just stuck at 2% for several months, for several quarters. What gets in there, Kevin, do you think? Yeah, it's probably going to be more on the economic activity front, I, specifically, again, to go back to the labor markets. If you were to all, the, all of a sudden see no growth in payrolls, maybe even a negative non-FAR payroll kind of number, I think that would certainly you know, catch the Fed's attention. But what I find very interesting is the shift in expectations from the markets. If we had been doing this interview just a couple of months ago, the expectation is we would have already had one rate cut by now. And actually what they did is raised rates, right, at the last meeting. But also back to what we've been discussing here for next year. Once again, you go back right after the May FOMC meeting, Fed funds futures were anticipating that Fed funds would be below 4% by January of next year. If you look at Fed funds futures now, you go all the way through the end of next year and the expectations is it'll be under four and a half percent. So, you know, you're not even talking about first quarter cutting in rates anymore. Now it's shifted more towards the second quarter. I, I would tend to agree with that. I don't always agree with Fed funds futures. They have a horrible track record, by the way. But in order to get the Fed to go sooner than what's being priced in now, I would watch the labor market report. I think that's going to be the signal for the Fed when to begin to shift the other way. But remember, it's not just the actual cut. When does Powell and company begin to guide us 
that's where they're going. So Kevin, what does that all mean from a strategy standpoint? I mean, you're a fixed income guy. What does that bond equity mix look like for you? Well, you know, I, I think once again, uh, you know, a bond guy is really happy to see a little bit of normalcy with interest rates, right? There's a whole generation of investors out there that have not seen interest rates at these levels. You know, we have to go back to 2007 or even a little bit further back to see, you know, Fed funds at five and a quarter, five and a half percent. So, you know, it was mentioned going into the break, higher for longer. I think that's how investors should be looking to position their fixed income portfolios into 2024, that even if the Fed cuts rates, they've gotten to the point that, you know, think about it. If they cut rates 100 basis points between now and the end of next year, which is what is the expectation, you're still talking about four and a quarter, four and a half percent on Fed funds. You know, I mean, that's a number, once again, a lot of people are not used to seeing. Kevin Flanagan, Wisdom Tree, head of fixed income strategy. We'll all be watching on Wednesday to see that FOMC statement come out. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Well, we are now into our second week of a trial dubbed one of the biggest antitrust cases ever. That is the United States versus Google. The tech giant is being accused of gaining market dominance through a series of coercive course of contracts, making it the default search engine on millions of devices. The company says it's being punished for its success. In these early stages, it's hard to predict which side will prevail. One way to read the tea leaves, though, is to look at the pages of history. In one case, often described as the biggest antitrust case ever, here with more is Alexis Keenan. You've been talking to some antitrust veterans. How do they see the Google case? Yeah, so I've been talking with attorneys on both sides of that AT&T case. It ended in a settlement that broke up the telecom giant. And one of those is Philip uh, Verveer. And at the time, he was a 30-year-old D Department of Justice attorney. And he's the one who drafted this case and eventually brought it, uh, led it against AT&T. Now, what he says is that that case, as well as the case that the Department of Justice brought against Microsoft, are similar. And they're instructive to how this case might turn out, because they are all vertical foreclosure cases. And what that is, it's an attack on companies that have used their vertical uh, integration of companies, of services, in order to foreclose on competition. Now, in AT&T's case, of course, that was local and long-distance service, as well as phone equipment. In Microsoft's case, that was their ownership of Internet Explorer, the browser that they then incorporated with Windows. Uh, but it's a hard win still for the DOJ here in antitrust, because since that time, since the AT&T case, the law has really narrowed in its interpretation. And so the environment, Verveer said, is really different here, and that will present the DOJ with a challenge. Also, on the other side of the aisle, I talked with another attorney, Carl Hittinger, and he was representing AT&T at the time. He said, look, if there is antitrust uh, uh, violations found, that fine, but that the knee-jerk reaction should not be to go in and uh, remedy the problem by a breakup as what happened with AT&T. He said that judges, the attorneys, that the public should caution against that being the logical solution for whatever problem in antitrust might be found through this trial. And Alexis, let me ask you a quick question. I mean, this is, you know, listen, this is a case, the street, investors are paying very close attention to. What's the timeline here, Alexis, for investors? Yeah, so this trial is slated to go nine weeks. I've heard anything from seven to 10 weeks. That puts us uh, well into a couple months from now. On top of that, we don't know how long the judge will take to make a decision. This is a bench trial. It won't be decided by a jury, uh, but that's not necessarily going to make it go any faster or slower. Then on top of it, you have to consider that if there is a loss for Google, that there will be an appeal in this case. So this could go on well into 2024. And then on top of it, you have a separate DOJ case that would be playing out in the Eastern District of Virginia, and that has yet to get underway into a trial. That one's a jury trial. Uh, so investors have a lot to watch in this next, I would say, coming year, and so far not really showing up in the numbers and the way the stock is trading. Uh, but I think that as we get closer to uh, hearing from this judge, we might start to see some action there. All right. Great insight. Alexis Keenan, thank you so much.
Well, we saw Bitcoin briefly breaking above that 27,000 handle for the first time this month ahead of the Federal Reserve's interest rate decision this week. And while traders look to push digital assets out of a muted range, a recent crypto market manipulation report spotlights a significant challenge to the crypto space. Wash trading, that's a form of fictitious trade and fraud, linked to market manipulation has riddled the crypto industry. According to Solid Solidus Labs, decentralized exchanges face $2 billion worth of wash trades since 2020. In an era of greater regulatory scrutiny, this adds a new wrinkle to the crypto market and traders. Here for a deeper dive, uh, let's bring in the founder, uh, co-founder and chief experience officer, Chen Arad. Chen, it's good to talk to you today. Uh, your report specifically highlights 67% of crypto trades manipulated by wash traders. What does that mean from a pricing standpoint? Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Uh, important to say it's 67% of uh, liquidity pools that we looked at. Liquidity pools are an important building block of every decentralized exchange. It's in practice where the trading happens. Uh, so uh, again, this is a sample of the market. Uh, of course, our goal here is to highlight that this is a challenge that these uh, crypto markets are facing. Uh, in practice, what it means is that uh, in uh, the parts of the market where uh, these, this happens, in decentralized exchange where this happens, uh, you know, uh, traders ultimately uh, face uh, prices that are manipulated. Uh, oftentimes, you know, wash trading is often used ultimately to uh, inflate volumes and uh, give the appearance of additional trading, more trading that actually happened. So, uh, you know, it's a good way for scammers or for people who often circulate uh, malicious crypto tokens to create the appearance of activity uh, to drive prices up in a way that is unfair. Uh, you know, important to say, uh, you know, I always try to emphasize this, you know, market manipulation is not a problem that just crypto deals with, right? Just uh, this past month, uh, two JP Mo the Department of Justice announced that two JP Morgan traders uh, are, gonna, uh, are sentenced to jail for, uh, uh, for, uh, 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 for manipulation of uh, derivative, uh, derivatives uh, about, uh, uh, that uh, the bank admitted to about two years ago and also paid a $1 billion fine. So again, Wherever there are markets, there's manipulation. Crypto introduces a lot of new ways to do this because it, it reinvents trading in some ways. And of course, our goal here is to highlight that this is a problem, but that there's a way to solve it. And it's actually easier to identify in uh, decentralized exchanges because of the transparency of the blockchain. And so, Ken, you talked about sort of the impact here of this manipulation on investors. What are, what are ways you think about how investors defend themselves, protect themselves from this? Right. So the you know in a lot of, in a lot of ways many of the merits of crypto and specifically DeFi decentralized finance uh, you know are also challenges. Ultimately, one of the goals of utilizing blockchain in order to create autonomous trading that doesn't depend on a, on you know on a centralized entity or bank or uh, you know a company that runs an exchange is that they're more accessible, they're open, they're permissionless is the term we like to use in the industry. But naturally, that also means. Uh, that it's easier for uh, scammers to to try and take advantage uh, of uh, you know low liquidity assets and specifically uh, of traders that uh, might not be aware of this. Again, a big part of the goal in this report is to raise awareness. Uh, one thing that we recommend is obviously anyone who engages in crypto, uh, specifically with DeFi, it's a new market. You have to be aware. You have to be careful. Uh, but it's also very transparent. Uh, you can. Uh, through research, uh, really, uh, you know, uh, learn what markets are more credible, uh, what markets are less credible. Uh, you know, I'll say, uh, you know, of the 30,000 liquidity pools, and again, those are the building blocks of decentralized exchanges that we looked at, uh, we found uh, of, of all of that volume, uh, about 13% uh, is manipulated. Some could argue that it's relatively low, lower than maybe uh, some, uh, you know, some yeah. would have assumed uh, exists in DeFi. Uh, so again, uh, learn, study, look for a lot of publicly available information and utilize the transparency in order to avoid, uh, you know, being scammed and manipulated. Um, Chen, what specific assets are we talking about? You know, we, we started the segment by talking about where Bitcoin prices are right now, uh, hovering close to that 27,000 handle. We're not talking about Bitcoin here, right? I mean, what are specific tokens that you've seen especially inflated as a result of this? Right, decentralized exchanges, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the largest decentralized exchanges, uh, you know, are based off of Ethereum, not 
Bitcoin. And based off of Ethereum, there are a lot of other kinds of tokens uh, that are built on that infrastructure. We're looking, we looked at around, uh, uh, you know, the, the tokens that we've identified that have been manipulated as part of the research and this sample, uh, there are uh, more than 20,000 of them. So oftentimes, uh, uh, the, the, the majority of those tokens are actually, uh, you know, meme tokens, low liquidity tokens. Oftentimes, you'll see, uh, 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 you know, scammers, manipulators issuing a token and then utilizing, um, you know, the way these markets work in order to wash trade, uh, you know, in kind of like the unique ways that you can do it in decentralized exchanges. Uh, there are, uh, not all of these tokens are malicious. In some cases, you see manipulators that are, uh, you know, just uh, 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 essentially uh, attacking uh, and manipulating uh, completely legitimate and benign tokens. Uh, but generally speaking, wash trading uh, is most effective for manipulators when they're looking at low liquidity, less known tokens. Oftentimes, those are, you know, meme tokens, very buzzy tokens where people don't think a lot. They kind of put money quickly because they want to make a lot of money. Uh, uh, kind of, you know, don't think about the risk for a second. And then through this sort of wash trading, uh, uh, which, which uh, you know, because of the open nature of these markets, uh, in some ways is easier to um, execute, uh, you know, would create the uh, appearance of volume to attract, yeah. uh, you know, uh, innocent traders uh, to invest in them. Yeah, interesting to see just how the price action has been affected by that as well. Chanarad, thank you so much for joining us today. Appreciate the time. Well, Thank coming up, oil at 10-month highs, a big problem for the Fed. But what are the upward catalysts that could send us to $100 a barrel? Supply cuts, a big bounce in China growth. We're going to discuss all that on the other side. Shares of embattled Chinese realtor Evergrande, uh, Evergrande are plunging on this Monday afternoon following news that police in the southern city of Shenzhen detained some staff at its wealth management unit. Now, the stock moves today followed massive volatility since the suspension was lifted on August 28th. This is just another roadblock for investors who have been forced to deal with a slowing economy in China, raising a key question. How should investors play the world's second largest economy? To help us answer that, let's bring in Brian McCarthy, MacroLens chief strategist and principal uh, and, and managing principal. It's good to talk to you today. Uh, there's a lot of investors trying to make sense of these headlines coming out of the real estate sector in China. How should they be thinking about this in the context of Evergrande, but also Country Garden. Sure. 
So I, I think from a, a big picture standpoint, you want to be thinking of Chinese real estate as in the post-bust phase. So, you know, we've seen, I, I think this is the biggest housing bubble we've ever seen. The value of the Chinese housing stock is on the order of $100 trillion by some estimates. Uh, we're talking about markdowns of 20, 30 percent already, in my view, probably headed to 50 or 60 percent. Massive inventory problems, probably $10 trillion worth of empty apartments that people have purchased and they're just not using them. And then another eight or $10 trillion worth of apartments sitting on the balance sheet of the developers who are desperate for cash. So this is just going to leave a, a, a sort of a GDP-sized hole in the Chinese balance sheet. So again, the real estate market in China is busted. We are in a post-bubble phase, and everything that you see out of China economically is going to look very different than it has in the last quarter of a century. And Brian, that's what I want to pick up with you. Is your Listen, your experience is so valuable here. You've been thinking about China, studying China, investing in China for a long time, a regular traveler there. When you think about the Chinese economy right now, Brian, you're highlighting some of these issues. It's high youth unemployment and tumbling exports, this property sector under pressure. Do you ultimately think, though, Brian, is this a soft patch that China pushes through and we see a red hot growth again on the other side? Or is something structurally changing there? Yeah, no, in my view, this is sort of the second inning of a nine inning crisis. Um, and, and, you know, there, it, it's, a, it's an interesting question because I talk to professional investors at large asset management firms of all kinds day in and day out. And I am amazed at how many people are really tempted to be the contrarian in China. There is a lot of bearishness out there, granted. Um, but in my view, the bearishness is fully justified. So I would recommend uh, not being tempted to try to play this as a soft patch or play for the next round of stimulus. Um, because if you look at the past rounds of stimulus, what they entailed in China, whether it was 2009 or 2012 in the wake of the Eurozone crisis, 2015 in the wake of the dollar rally, China did in fact stimulate out of a downturn by pushing credit growth from say 10% up to 15 to 20 and watching that credit force through the real estate market in a way that lifted the economy. Now, they don't want to do that, and even if they decided they wanted to do it, I believe that the sentiment in the Chinese real estate is now broken to the extent where it wouldn't work. So if they pumped all that credit, instead of coursing through uh, another round of real estate speculation, that money would just want to leave China. So I don't think they're going to either want to or be able to stimulate themselves out of this downturn the way they have in the past. This is a, a structural downturn, not simple. Yeah, and obviously a big concern given how much real estate ha has played, the role it's played in, in boosting China's growth. What about American companies that have significant exposure to China? We obviously you know, saw Apple uh, move a leg down. Part of that was some other headlines that wasn't necessarily related to the macro picture. But how do you think investors should be looking at that, whether it's an Apple or a Starbucks? If the expectation is that the real estate you know, sector could unravel further, it's a big driver in the economy. What happens to those American companies that have significant exposure there? Yeah, they're going to need to revisit their assumptions about revenue growth in that market. And, um, you know, we will find out that a lot of multinational companies have made bad bets in terms of the growth of the Chinese consumer. Uh, the rebalancing to consumption is not going to happen. Okay, that would require marketization. You can only have a consumer led economy if capital is allowed to be allocated in pursuit of serving consumers. That's not how the Chinese system works. The central planners in Beijing are actually increasing their control over the capital allocation process, which now extends even to tech. So you've got the central planning commission in the big tech firms trying to help them with their venture capital investments to make sure they're consistent with natural, national strategic goals. So the whole consumer story in China uh, in my view, has very, very much predicated on a high rate of credit growth coursing through this real estate market, uh, creating wealth that we're now finding is fictional. So unfortunately, a, a lot of multinational companies will have greatly overestimated the scope uh, to generate revenues in that market.
We saw, uh, we heard from uh, Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo recently, who talked about China being uninvestable for some of these companies. A story, of course, to continue to follow. Brian McCarthy from Macro Lens. Good to talk to you today. Thanks, Cooper. Well, coming up, we're going to bring you the closing bell on Wall Street Plus. We'll dive into the UAW's historic strike and what a prolonged stoppage could mean for the Biden administration. We'll be right back. at the closing bell on Wall Street on this Monday. Uh, let's do a quick check of the market sponsored by Tasty Trade. Uh, we've got a bit of a holding pattern here as investors really look ahead to Wednesday and that FOMC decision. The Dow and the S&P 500 Nasdaq trading pretty flat, although the S&P 500 uh, snapping that two-week losing streak. Uh, looking at uh, up just about three points there. Um, let's take a look at some of the top trending tickers that we are watching from this session. And we're kicking things off with shares of vaccine makers moving lower today after Pfizer's finance chief predicted weaker demand for COVID shots this year. CFO David Denton said Pfizer projects uh, projects a 24% COVID vaccination rate in the U.S. Just for some perspective there, Josh, um, that's lower than the flu vaccine rate, that's about 50%. And this, of course, comes at a time where you've got the Pfizer's and Moderna's of the world trying to find for the next big act on the yep. back of the COVID vaccine. The 24% rate that we're talking about today, at least, uh, that was projected by Pfizer's CFO, certainly way lower than what the street was expecting, which is why we've seen uh, those shares moving lower. Makes sense. And moving on, shares of Microsoft today, uh, Looks like we're heading, did we finish lower on there? Yep, down about, we'll call it four tenths of a percent. That's after uh, product chief Panas Panay is stepping down, according to Bloomberg. He will join Amazon.com to run the unit responsible for the firm's Alexa and Echo products. Yahoo Finance's Dan Howley is joining us now for more on this. So Dan, walk me through this news. What'd you make of it? Yeah, it's actually very surprising news. Uh, we have Microsoft set to host an event on the 21st uh, to unveil what uh, is expected to be some new Surface products. And Panos uh, was basically one of the uh, leaders of that unit that got Microsoft's hardware off the ground and going, those, those Surface devices. Uh, he then became uh, the head of Windows uh, as well. So the, the fact that he's stepping down at this point uh, really is a, a shock. And also, uh, you know, part of the Bloomberg report also says that he may be going over to Amazon to fill Dave uh, Limp's position. He's leaving Amazon's hardware division uh, after the shakeups that the, that had seen following the layoffs from the company. So there's reports that Panos may end up going over to Amazon and fill that role. Uh, you know, like I said, this is a very uh, big change for the company. Um, they do say that they're still 
wholeheartedly behind the surface line of products. Uh, and, you know, as I said, there's, there's expected to be some uh, of those new pieces of hardware announced later this week. And then what kind of bench does Microsoft have here? I mean, as you, as you know, I mean, a big name here leaving. Do they have a bench they can count on to pick up the slack? Yeah, I mean, look, the thing about Panos uh, was or is that he's very charismatic uh, when he hosts these events where he shows off his uh, devices or, or the devices from Microsoft. He really is, you know, going out and, and kind of proselytizing for the brand. Uh, and he's done that very well. Uh, you know, I think that moving forward, they do have uh, executives in place that are going to be taking over, take, taking over those roles, excuse me. Uh, but really, you know, I think uh, above all, he was a, a panel's a very good showman for Microsoft. And look, when they, they rolled out the Surface line of devices, uh, you know, this was based, that was basically Microsoft's way of saying to the PC market in general, look, this is how you can make PCs that look great and run really well. Um, and so, you know, if you look at a Surface device, uh, whether it's the, the two-in-one, the, the tablet uh, style uh, that has the keyboard, or the actual Surface laptops, uh, they look fantastic. And, you know, they can go head-to-head -head, uh, with Apple, which for a while was really the only brand that was selling hardware that looked great. Microsoft came out with the Surface line, said this is the way it's done, and then uh, OEMs started to follow suit. Now you have all of these great-looking uh, devices on the market as a result of that. So that, you know, part of that was was uh, Panos is doing. And so we'll, we'll just have to see if they, they stay on uh, with the Surface line of products in the long term. Uh, and then what this means for Windows and, and the products that are going to be coming out uh, from that division as well. All right, covering all things tech for us. Dan Howley, thank you for your time. Switching gears, oil at $90 a barrel looks unsustainable in the long term, thanks, according to one city analyst who predicts prices may reach $100 for a short while. As the likes of Saudi Arabia and Russia cut exports, crude has been on an upward trend over the past three months, hitting 2023 highs today. And here with more is Yahoo Finance's Inez Ferreira. Inez. Yeah, Josh, and Citi's global head of commodities, Ed Morse, put out a note basically saying that, yes, you could see oil heading to $100 a barrel for a short while, but then you are going to see a pullback. And of course, that spike is because of the supply cuts from Saudi Arabia and also the export cuts from Russia. But he says that you could see more of a downturn next year for oil. He also talks about oil supply from non-OPEC plus members to the like of the U.S., Canada, Brazil. He even talks about Iran and Venezuela beefing up their supply. That's that seeping into the global oil market. And also saying, look, Saudi Arabia could reverse their unilateral cuts if the markets get too tight. Now, he's not the only analyst to talk about $100 a barrel oil. By the way, on our Wi-Fi Interactive, you're looking at Brent crude above $94 a barrel today and WTI above $91 a barrel. But RBC Capital also has recently said that you could see $100 oil if momentum in the market continues, but that is not their base case. Now, if we take a look at the derivatives of oil at refined products coming out of oil, gasoline today hitting a 2023 high at $3.88 per gallon. You also have diesel fuel that over the last month from a month ago is up 23 cents. And then you've also had the airlines recently warning about a profit pinch uh, because they have seen the cost of jet fuel go higher. All of this at a time when the Federal Reserve is trying to clamp down on inflation. All right, Inez, great stuff there. Thank you so much. Well, President Joe Biden can't seem to get a break with voters with a weak approval rating stuck around 40 percent. Rick Newman has one idea for how he can quickly become more popular. Rick, uh, you have a direct line to the White House because, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, improved inflation certainly hasn't helped the president. What else? Unfortunately, could? I don't. Uh, but that allows me to, I guess, say whatever I want to say. Um, I think uh, Pre President Obama, uh, excuse me, President Biden's popularity would skyrocket if he would just announce his retirement. Um, we have been talking about Biden's age all year. We're going to keep talking about it. You know, Mitt Romney said last week that he is not going to run for re-election when his current term expires. He's only 76 compared with 80 for Biden. And he said, you know, by the time my next, my next term ends, if I ran for re-election, I'd be in my mid-80s and that's too old. We need younger leaders in Washington. But Biden seems to think that 
it would be a defeat or some sort of admission of failure if he only ran for one term. I mean, th I think this is giving retirement a bad name. What is wrong with retirement? I mean, look what happens in the private sector. I looked this up today, the average age of a CEO in the S&P 500, it's not in the 70s or the 80s. The average age of a CEO is 58. Many companies, publicly owned companies, um, have a mandatory retirement age, which is typically between 65 and 70. And yes, Warren Buffett is 93 and he's still CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, but it's his company. He built it. He can do whatever he wants. And he's obviously still, still doing a great job and the shareholders want him there. We have a retirement problem in Washington, D.C., which is that nobody retires. We got politicians, especially in the Senate, who overstay their welcome. They do the same thing at the Supreme Court. Uh, why doesn't Biden set an example and say, I am going to retire because it's the honorable thing to do, and I'm going to encourage younger people to the next generation of leaders to uh, take over the Democratic Party. I don't think he's going to do it, but if he did, I think Americans would be grateful and I think it might even make him a better former president in historical terms. So, Rick, uh, just so you know, I, I have no problems with retirement. I, I can't wait to retire, Rick. But on, I on mean, this don't, point, don't most Americans like they plan their whole lives to retire. What's what's wrong with these people in Washington? Anyway, go ahead, John. I don't get it all. Rick, I'm with you. But let me ask you this question. Let's say Democratic Party leaders, they take your advice. They say to President Biden, listen, we're looking at the numbers. It doesn't look good, Mr. President. You've got to step down. Who do you think kind of picks up the torch? I mean, who is the viable candidate? Is, is it the vice president? Is it Governors Newsom or Shapiro? Who do you think? Well, th I mean, this is the obvious, obvious conundrum for Democrats is um, they don't think they have a good understudy waiting in the wings to replace President Biden. Uh, Kamala Harris ran a poor campaign for president, uh, her own presidential campaign in 2020, and she has not distinguished herself as vice president. She might uh, come out of it. She might um, turn out to be a better presidential candidate in 2024. But, you know, we could have, I, I mean, the clock is ticking here and we're almost out of time for Democrats to actually do this. But if we had an open race, uh, there are some viable Democrats. That it doesn't have to be whoever's in the White House right now. Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, he might be too liberal for, uh, for a lot of Americans and he'd have to explain away $7 gasoline prices in California. I think that would be hard. But the, this is also a self-defeating argument. If you say, well, we should keep the old guy in as young as possible because we don't think there's any viable fresh blood. Well, guess what? You're not going to develop your next generation of leaders. I mean, in institutions that study leadership, such as some corporations, the U.S. military does this. I mean, it's well understood that you need to cultivate new leaders by letting them lead. You don't say you have to stay forever in the shadow of the institution's eminence and wait until that person dies in order to get your chance at leadership. So, uh, you know, we are in a situation, the Democratic Party, and by the way, same problem in the Republicans. Donald Trump is 77. Um, so if Biden weren't so old, then Democrats would be able to say the Republican candidate is too old. Maybe if the Democrats had somebody who, were in the, who was in their 50s, imagine that, they could say, hey, we got youth on our side. It's the Republicans running the old man, not us. All right, Rick Newman, love having you on. Thank you so much for that insight. And coming up, Bye, guys. to the moon. No, literally, what will it take to colonize that giant rock in space? Rovers, robots, maybe it's just the ability to get there now and again. Yahoo Finance's next laser focuses on a business looking to make big moves in space.
I think the future of the moon is a routine, regular access to the moon. same way that we're talking about hotels for private citizens in space. Hotels on the moon? It will be a little while, but I think that's a possibility sometime in the future. The future is unfolding at Astrobotics headquarters in Pittsburgh. Inside this vast facility, researchers are laying the groundwork for a reality once limited to science fiction, human life on the moon. Yeah. Hair mask on? Hair mask on. One size fits all? There's a few different sizes. A small is too big for me. We all ready? All right. <laughs> Astrobotics ambitions are driven by CEO John Thornton, his lifelong vision taking shape inside a clean room so secure, few outside the company are allowed in. That is the largest lander of any kind since Apollo, as you're seeing right ah. there. It's going to deliver a 1,000 pound rover that NASA's building called Viper to the pole of the moon to drill for water. Space landers built here will carry the load for the lunar economy, shuttling cargo from the Earth to the moon. The amount of precision required and the amount of engineering that's required to get every gram of performance out of this vehicle, <laughs> it's tremendous. The Peregrine Lander marks the first real test for astrobotics technology. It's housed inside the most secure confines of its facility. We're walking into a, an area that has less than 10,000 parts per million in, in dust and debris in the air. So we need to be very, very clean to make sure that our dry skin or our hair or any, any debris that comes from us doesn't end up on the spacecraft. The Peregrine is engineered with its own electronics, propulsion, and communication systems. The vehicle will be loaded onto a ULA Vulcan rocket. If it lands successfully, it would mark the first commercial lunar landing in history, beating out their primary competitor, Japan's iSpace. You talked about Astrobotics' mission being, you know, sort of democratizing access to the moon. Why is it so difficult to get there? First, you've got to build the spacecraft here on Earth. You've got to uh, get it up into space. That's relatively easy now, especially with the likes of the rise of commercial launch uh, uh, groups like SpaceX, for example, making access to space affordable and routine. But the next big challenge is when you go out to the moon is you, you have to build a spacecraft that can fly for up to a month or more at a time through space, get out to the moon, uh, drop into lunar orbit, and then descend for a soft landing down on the surface. No private group has so far been successful to land on the surface themselves. Um, we hope to be the first. Success on that initial landing will pave the way for Astrobotics' next phase, building out the moon's infrastructure. It's part of a $470 billion global industry, largely dominated by the U.S. While satellites and rockets have attracted a bulk of the space investments, infrastructure spending is growing. Most people think of space as, as NASA and the government agencies, but less than 20% of that $470 billion is actually government activity. So the, the rise of commercial space is thriving right now and only projected to continue to grow. And the moon is going to play a very important part of that. Playing in that space requires navigating the moon's extremes. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. That light you see there is what they call Earth shine. It's essentially the reflection of the light through the Earth's atmosphere. And that really bright light you see back there is the sunlight. And they do this to make sure that their software can operate in these conditions. The lighting conditions in space are very challenging. There's no atmosphere that will diffuse the light and make it change directions and kind of even it out. And dark in space is very dark. Like there's zero light reflected around. The tests are done to ensure these robots can navigate the lunar surface in spite of that. This one known as Cube Rover is designed to carry payloads across challenging terrain filled with tiny particles known as moon dust. So this is pretty similar to what we know as regolith, which is on the lunar surface. And I mean, it kind of feels like sand. 
One of the biggest issues on the moon is the dust. Um, it's almost talcum powder-like uh, sized. It's, it's very sticky, it's very uh, electrostatically charged, it sticks to stuff like static, and that can get on all kinds of things and cause all kinds of problems. To address that, Jay Eckerd's teams built a wireless charger that can operate even with a moon dust storm, giving rovers and landers a direct source of power. So the expectation is that you, you take this to the moon, you're gonna get all the regular in there, but you want to make sure that it's still transferring power. That's right, because if you run out of power on the moon, that's game over. You don't get to go up there and plug it in or, or you know, bring in extra batteries. To ensure reliable access to power, Astrobotics also building out a portable grid that provides solar energy. This Luna grid will act as a type of mini gas station, generating and distributing power. That's especially critical during the lunar night, which spans 14 days gets down to liquid nitrogen cold for two weeks. And that kills a lot of spacecraft. So if you can survive that night, you can then do multiple year-long uh, expeditions on the surface of the moon. It's a future Astrobotic is working closely with NASA on. The company secured multiple contracts valued at $450 million. Next year, this Griffin lander is set to carry NASA's own rover, Viper, as part of the Artemis mission. That robot will be tasked with looking for a water in the deepest craters of the moon. If they're successful, Thornton says it will open the floodgates for space exploration. So water at the poles of the moon could be like oil it was here on Earth for, for the beginnings of our space travel. So that could be how we go back and forth from the moon. That could be how we refuel our spacecraft to go to Mars and other deep space destinations nations, but it all starts right here with our nearest neighbor, the moon. That 240,000 mile journey from the Earth to the moon, unlocking a new vision that could propel humans into the next frontier. So Josh, I have to tell you, in reporting this, it was a real lesson in where we are in the space race. We have seen in recent weeks this huge race accelerate among governments. India became the fourth country recently to reach the moon, but also the first country to reach the south pole of the moon. And we keep hearing, I keep hearing that, that the poles of the moon are key because that's where the resources are. And you heard John Thornton from Astrobotic there say, look, if you can find water there, that leads to so much more possibilities. And ultimately it is about humans being able to spend more time on the moon that opens things up in terms of space exploration. Well, first of all, congrats, Yugi. That was a phenomenal piece. And I know just the reporting, the research, the writing, the, the producing that goes into something like that, that takes a lot of time and effort. So congrats, very cool. Uh, the time and effort and money going, being directed to the moon right now, why the moon, Akiko? Why now? Th that was one of my first questions, which is, you know, you think about, you know, the moon landing. I mean, that was in the 70s. That was, you know, roughly 50 years ago. Why is it now? Part of this is about the commercial companies being able to pick up the slack, too. We're seeing a lot of private public partnerships. And really, why the moon? It's because the moon is seen as a stepping stone to other space exploration. So you've heard the likes of Elon Musk say, we want to think about colonizing Mars. Well, you can't be commuting back and forth between the Earth and Mars. And the thinking here is that the moon is a good base. It's a good landing spot to be able to explore other parts, other planets. That's kind of been the focus right there, but you gotta get the infrastructure there first going before you can look to, to elsewhere. Akiko, okay, phenomenal job, congrats again. Thank you, thank you. All right, let's move on here uh, to the markets. We're at the New York Stock Exchange, taking a look at where things traded today. Uh, the Dow, uh, uh, well, we saw all three uh, majors in the green there, um, trading pretty flat though, as we said. Um, investors kind of in a holding pattern here, looking ahead to the FOMC meeting in this market check brought to you by Tasty Trade. Okay, and coming up after a lot of criticism, actress Drew Barrymore reversing her decision to return her show to air while Hollywood writers remain on strike. In an Instagram post, Barrymore apologized for her decision, saying, we really tried to find our way forward, and I truly hope for resolution for the entire industry very soon. So this is, it gotten pretty contentious for Drew Barrymore, and you know, I. It's interesting to see how this has all played out. By the way, it's not just Drew Barrymore. Bill Maher said he would resume, you know, tapings for his show. Since then, he's reversed course today because now we know that the WGA is, in fact, meeting with AMPTP, um, which is, represents the studios. But 
it, it, it really points to what, Josh, I have heard a lot on the sidelines in LA, not necessarily something people want to say publicly, which is what happens to those who are below the line. So we talk right. about below the line. Which we're was talking, Bill Maher's point, by the way. Bill Maher's yeah. point. We heard Drew Barrymore say, look, there's about 150 jobs that are on the line. Yes, everybody, as in even those who are below the line, are in support of this strike. They understand why these unions are striking. But with every month, every week, really, that goes by, you're looking at what could be a wash for the rest of the year. Yeah. Well, I turn to you, Akiko, as you know, for these questions, because you live in Los Angeles. That's the one qualification I'm looking for <laughs> in my experts. What are the big issues left between these two sides? So we did hear at least there's negotiation, so maybe that's a sign of thawing. But what are the big, is it AI? Is it wages, transparency? What's left Well, here? it's kind of all of the above. AI, obviously, is something we've talked about a lot. You know, there are concerns, you know, both from writers as well as actors about AI sort of replacing the humans in the room. But it is also about the structure of these streaming services right now. I heard over and over from writers who say, look, you know, when you had a network show, we're talking what, 20 episodes, more than that? Now you're talking, think about the content that you consume, yep. right? We're a talking lot about of 10 episodes, you right. know? There are shorter spans, the shorter spans that they work. Now, I will say in the initial days, you would talk to writers and they would say, look, this isn't that big of a hit financially because we're used to having three months off. That is the very reason we're striking because we want a steadier pay. Now we're talking about going into set, well, end of September, really. And the concern is, you know, there's been pressure that's been mounting that if they don't get a deal by the beginning of October, is that it's the, a wash yeah, for is, the so year. Is that, is that considered the deadline here? I know the, the pipeline's been frozen, but is that the cutoff point? So no real official deadline, but yeah. there have been reports of sort of high profile riders that have really been pressing the WGA to say, you got to come back to the table here because we're looking at getting closer and closer to year end. We can't go a full year without content. And that's sort of the point that Bill Mars made. But again, Wednesday, we're looking at both sides coming back to the table. So hopefully some developments on that front. All right, coming up, it's time for your Yahoo Finance Live panel du jour. Is that what we're calling it now? Panel du jour, Sounds the dark fancy. side. Yeah. Today, uh, let's take a, we're gonna be talking about uh, child star turned talk show host Drew Barrymore getting herself into some very hot water. Ali, or actually Josh and company, standing by for us. Don't want to miss it.
Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. Hey guys, back with Yahoo Finance Live, joined by Josh Schaefer and Brooke De Palma here for our little roundtable discussion of, you know, a lot of big topics. And of course, I can't get enough of Drew Barrymore. I just think it's a stunning reversal uh, from her when she said that, you know, my show's gonna go on hiatus. Actually, it's not. I'm bringing it back during the WGA and SAG strike. Now she's, of course, backtracking, saying she can't do that. I heard she heard everyone, the criticism from other actors and writers. The show's going back on hiatus sort of follows also Bill Maher. Bill Maher did a similar thing where he said his show's gonna come back, I wanna support the blow the line workers, but then he also backtracked saying, you know what, we're gonna go on hiatus for now. He said that the, the, the writers being back at the table, the negotiating table made, made it so he's like, I'll, I'll take a step back, let this happen. But you know, kind of kind of goes to show you the, the, the pressure that production companies face, uh, the workers that are below the line, that aren't guild workers, all that kind of, Stuff's coming to a head right now, and it's been over what over six months that they've been yeah. on strike right. since April. Yeah. yeah, and it's just interesting to think process you said about the workers that aren't in the guild that then are out of work, right? And how bad I think someone like Drew Barrymore probably honestly feels about that, right? You normally your stardom sort of supports them, and yeah. you're able to have the show, and the people are able to have work because of that. So I think there is an unselfish part of also wanting to do this too, yeah. where you are helping other people but then you're sort of going against the other people you're supposed to be. It, yeah. There's that really way. no, I, no I, I don't think there's a winning decision to, to be decision. made. Right, unless they sort of fix it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also too, it's been interesting to see the way that other hosts have sort of approached the situation. We know that the late night hosts have sort of come together. They have that Strike Force 5 podcast. That's mm -hmm. Colbert, Kimmel. Have you heard of this yet? Mm -mm. Jimmy Fallon, John Oliver, Seth Meyers. And interestingly enough, this weekend, three out of five of them are actually doing a live version of the show in Las Vegas and they advertise it at the top of their host sort of playing all together. Yeah. But but think about all their staffers that are largely out of work as well. And I think the way that all these hosts have approached it and Drew Barrymore maybe tipped over the line and now of course as you noted reversed it is this united front. Many in Hollywood uh, convincing many others to come across as one force so that that deal is reached and, and if anybody steps out of line then others sort of you know saying wait a second guys we have to be united in order to get a decision here. But it's not all shows, right? The View right. is on right now, and they do like a, I guess a non, there's no monologue, it's all ad-lib, and right. then people like Whoopi Goldberg uh, are part of a different, uh, uh, a signatory to a different type of contract mm -hmm. that allows them to do these types of shows without violating SAG or, or WGA uh, restrictions. So it's funny because that's a juggernaut show that makes a lot of money. And I think that's what's happening with Drew Barrymore. She's from the pressure from a production company. Uh, and I think they said that we understand her, her concerns. It's a very complicated issue. We're not going to force her. But I think there is still some you know, pressure there. The production right. companies and the broadcast yeah. channels want content. And yeah. the channel, and the channels want yeah. content. Right, yeah. the channels want content. I mean, you have ABC and ESPN coming out today saying that they're gonna be playing 10 more simulcasts of Monday Night Football. Monday Night Football is normally only on ESPN. Right. Right. You're now gonna get those games on ABC. Right. Pretty much specifically because of the writer's strike. Roger Goodell, yeah. the commissioner of the NFL, referenced that in a big story last last week, saying that he thinks because of the writer's strike, they're going to be able to quote unquote fill content. Mm -hmm. Obviously, sports is big content, but fascinating to see how the longer this thing goes on, Before how do you happens. fill content to literally just have new things yeah. on your television? One other thing I noticed, I'm sorry. Um, oh, so uh, uh, CBS brought Yellowstone. 
Mm -hmm. Right, they're airing it on CBS now. A big show for them now. So reruns of, of Yellowstone, it was like the most, uh, the biggest mm -hmm. uh, Sunday night or whatever they have, 6.5 yeah. million viewers watched reruns of Yellowstone on CBS. So there's a way to sort of try to finagle themselves around this right. strike that seems to be ongoing. We'll see how long it lasts, I'm not right. sure. And we've talked about it so often, this, this, uh, this rise of reruns and also the boom that reality TV shows got back in 2007, 2008 during the last writer's strike. And so we often talk on this roundtable about just the further repercussions, whether it be more sports shows or more reruns or perhaps more reality shows that come out after this. And so stay tuned for more content on that front. But one thing that I'm watching is the impact that social media has on spending power. According to a new bank rate survey, uh, Americans spent 71, oh my God, look at this, $71 billion on social media impulse buys in the past 12 months. Now in one year, the average impulse buyer spends $754. Now when I heard this, I actually wasn't too surprised. I feel like this So what are you buying off Instagram then, Brooke? I what are you buying? I have to say, I have bought a few That's things. That's a lot. That's a lot of money, yeah. but the ease at which you can go on Like to Know It, which I have tempted myself to undownload and redownload a million times, yeah. buy something, or even the link to Amazon, how easy it is to purchase, and then Apple Pay is connected to your phone. I find myself in a few. I, I bought a, a beach chair once that I ended up returning. I they get like, me with hats. Good. I love baseball hats. I always get different baseball hats. They always, <laughs> I feel like I'm buying like a hat a month now. I should probably get a subscription oh with the amount of things. <laughs> so shirts, we all sell to this. I'll buy shirts and then they'll always have like, they everything's 25% off now, right? Off yeah. Instagram. So then you're like, oh, I'm getting a deal. deal. You get Put caught in up in it that way. I guarantee, Pro's probably buying watches. Oh no. I, Those I'm, are gonna, I'm gonna tell you, I, no watches, but I, I have bought several things off of Instagram. Instagram, etc. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I, I'm happy with my purchase. Oh, really? I bought a backpack. I got some T-shirts. I got all kinds yeah. of stuff. And I, and I, and it's like it's so easy. It's, it's ease yeah. of use. I'm already there. It's super simple. It's already got my you know Facebook's got myself connected, connected right the, with IG. I'm not sure if TikTok is doing the same. But mm -hmm. uh, big picture though, this is a big win I think for these social media channels that are able to monetize directly from ads to the e-commerce site to my home, I think it's a big win. Right? You made yeah, a great quick point. Turnaround. Oh, well, you made a great point off the top there too. That I think in the beginning, I always thought like, oh, you ordered that off Facebook, right? And you thought that it wouldn't come in good, and now it's like just legit companies. You know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. Nike sends you promotions through Facebook to the real Nike website, and right. you're ordering off Nike. And I think five years ago, that wasn't really the case, and you were sort of worried about your parents getting scammed on Where Facebook. Where am I buying this from? Where yeah. is it coming from? And then yeah. also, they have such good, I'm, I'm sorry, they can tar they, they're targeting me in a good way. Right. Because they know everything about me, they know what I want, and it's like, it's like they know I'm looking for a backpack, and here yeah. you go, there it is, the one I want. It's it nice is. and clean, black, big, It's so big, easy to get. Now, I zippers. will say another yeah. point in the survey is that men spent an average of $999 compared to women who spent just 518 so it sounds Men's like you two more. are more I could totally see that. I could totally see that. Do you think that. so? Because men are I, lazy, right? We don't want to go to the store. <laughs> I if will you say, put, I think twice. Well, because I bought work clothes off Instagram yeah, or right, like a button down right. shirt that I would not normally go shop for. But if you're going to tell me it's on sale and you're putting it right in front of my face while I'm it. sitting yeah. on my couch, yeah. oh, I could use a new shirt. A new yeah. shirt. yeah. So I don't know. They get you in that way. And yeah. it, it's something that Facebook and Meta has benefited from, right? right? And so is TikTok. And it's been interesting to see another story I was tracking today, a great story in Bloomberg about how Meta has sort of bounced back, right? Mm -hmm. And the different things that have come back as we've seen Meta's ad revenue bounce back and they have more people shopping on the app, people staying on these apps longer. Interesting right. to see Meta now getting back to some branded merch repurchases at oh. the office, reopening some of the restaurants that were at the office. So some of those tech benefits Bloomberg is reporting from multiple employees are coming back to Meta. To me, it kind of makes sense. When you take a look at Meta's revenue over the last couple quarters, they've clearly performed well. It makes sense to reward your employees. I know it's been the year of efficiency, but at some point, if you're doing well, it makes sense to start acting like a company that's doing well again and make sure you keep these people yeah. working there. Yeah, and I think that's the key to tech right now after so many layoffs. How exactly do they keep that morale high? How exactly do they recruit and maintain talent? And I feel like, you know, in recent years, the, the flock to want to work at these companies, that was largely lost during the pandemic where people didn't want to go in office. People didn't necessarily care to go in office. But before that, Facebook, Google, they were known for these major headquarters where you could get get laundry service, go to the gym, get haircuts, get mm -hmm. dinner, get lunch. But now I believe if I read that right, now dinner time's been moved up in the evening, so they're encouraging more of a work-life balance, mm -hmm. something that we didn't see pre-pandemic, so maybe a good thing.
that they did that. Yeah, they have a, like a three a three day a minimum or a return to work policy. Mm -hmm. So the, you're going to want that those those the free lunches, the stand ups, the things like that, the the haircuts and the dry cleaning. But oh, I got to tell you, you we just had a short, uh, chart up one year chart. I think it was Facebook up 100. 150% over the last year, that's what gets the remaining employees very happy is right. my stock options are now in the money. Right. Right. I'm very happy about that. So that's what makes morale, morale go up. I mean, they had yep. laid off 10,000 workers. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, it's an insane amount, but it right. kind of shows you how many people are there to begin with. And now I guess they're happier with certain policies being back in place, old Facebook returning, but it certainly helps that the stock is back up where right. it needs I to be. I will say on a two year, if we could pull up a two year chart, that is actually down 17%. And so with that in Hasn't mind- come all the way back. Yeah. Yeah, and so so keep in mind this is still you know riding the impact yeah. of those layoffs, yeah. riding the impact of the pandemic, where Meta was largely looking for which way to go next, and mm. and so definitely perhaps these entices. But I will say the the laundry service you don't have to pay for that, so not everything's back, guys. Not There's everything's back. You still have to pay for the laundry. I'll take I'll take a free dinner and maybe a discounted haircut. I've been told I need a haircut. No, so maybe I'll take a discounted one, right? Put it online. No haircut for Josh. No haircut for me. It's the flow. But I am gonna go Love shop on Facebook Marketplace, so we gotta wrap it up over shirts. here. We'll have more Yahoo Finance Live on the other side. Well, Apple's next generation AirPod Pros are getting big software improvements as well as a new charging case. Yahoo Finance's Dan Halley, always on the case for us. He's got his hands on a pair. What's the verdict? Yeah, I mean, look, these are the best AirPods that you can get uh, hands down. These are the Air Air AirPods Pro 2, call them the AirPods Pro second generation, uh, but uh, they have this USB-C charging case now. It's also got uh, MagSafe charging, so if you have uh, an Apple Watch as well, you can slap it on your Apple Watch charger or any other uh, mm -hmm. kind of uh, wireless charger that uh, this supports. The, the, the case itself is great. It's got USB-C. If uh, you have an iPhone 15, uh, when that comes out, you'll be able to plug that into uh, from the uh, USB cord from your iPhone 15 to the AirPods Pro case and actually charge the AirPods Pro case in that way. Outside of that, the AirPods are essentially unchanged from the prior uh, AirPods Pro second generation with the, the Lightning case. The big deal here is all of the software. Um, essentially, what Apple has done is fully updated the software to include three new features, uh, and that includes uh, a new adaptive listening uh, kind of preset, uh, conversation awareness, uh, and then personalized volume. And the, the adaptive uh, listening part is really what's uh, impressive. It takes advanced noise cancellation uh, and then Apple's transparency mode and noise cancellation basically uses 
uh, reverse or, or the uh, the opposite radio frequency of sounds that uh, the AirPods hear around you uh, to cancel out outside noise. And then transparency basically amplifies outside noise. So if you're walking down the street, uh, you want to make sure that you can hear what's going on around you. You can use transparency. Uh, if you're on a subway and you just want to block out all the noise, you would use uh, noise cancellation. Uh, adaptive uh, audio basically takes those two and mashes them together. So it's not exactly uh, noise cancellation. It's not exactly transparency. Uh, you can hear people talk uh, to a degree if they're you know calling out to you with this feature on. So it's really nice to see. The other big feature and something that has come in handy in my life uh, so far uh, is conversation awareness. And this basically uh, allows the AirPods to recognize that you're speaking to someone uh, and then drop down the volume of whatever you're listening to uh, and then raise it back up uh, after a, a few seconds of you not speaking anymore. And I got to say, you know, it really makes things a lot easier. Uh, usually if I go into a store and I go to the uh, the, the checkout counter, I got to pull awkwardly pull out one AirPod or, you know, if my, my wife's talking to me and I have my AirPods and I got to pull it out. Now I can just, you know, start talking to someone and I can just leave it in. So it's, it's a lot easier that way. And then personalized volume is a way uh, for the uh, AirPods to kind of pick up how you listen over time and then adjust the volume to your liking based on the kind of content you listen to. So, I mean, overall, these are some, some big, big changes. You can also thankfully finally mute your phone calls with the airpods uh, if you're talking to someone you just tap on the uh the stem once and if you want to hang up you double tap so really big updates if you already have the airpods pro 2 uh there's no reason to upgrade uh you get the software for free uh the charging case uh though you're gonna have to buy a whole new pair if you want that usb c port and so, Dan, so investors, you know, they pay attention here because analysts estimate AirPods probably represent around 5% of total company revenue. So this is a real meaningful business line for the company. And just to emphasize there, I'm just curious who you think this is for. In other words, you're saying, listen, if Josh has his AirPods, which I do, and they're working fine, I don't need to go out, rush out and buy these right now? Yeah, no, not not at all. I think that this is for people who either have older AirPods and, you know, they're still first generation AirPods out there. People may want to upgrade or people who just haven't purchased them yet at all. And I think that's really what the, the market is for these. Um, I think that, you know, when it comes to the, the case itself, it's USB-C. It's 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 nice to have, uh, but it's really, you know, not that different from the lightning ones. Uh, but the devices themselves uh, are the same and it's the, it's the software changes that really matter. Okay. I don't know. You've convinced me I may want an upgrade. Maybe I just want an excuse to upgrade. <laughs> Dan Halley, as always, on the case for us. Thanks so much. All right. The global music industry experienced record revenues in 2022. That's according to IFPI's Global Music Report. Flash forward to 2023 and Beyonce's Renaissance Tour and Taylor Swift's Eras Tour as fans generating billions in economic activity. According to Polestar, Taylor Swift's tour is on pace to earn a record-breaking $1 billion in sales. And meanwhile, Beyonce's tour achieving a record-breaking one-month gross, according to Billboard. So where does this leave investors looking to get in on the music industry action? Here to discuss, we have David Schulhoff, founder and CEO of Music. So David, maybe just to begin, give us the 30,000 foot view here of this industry. How healthy is it, Dave? What kind of attendance, participation, and engagement are you seeing? Yeah, so thanks for, first, uh, thanks a lot for having me on the show. So, uh, you know, I'm the founder and CEO of MUSQ. We're the first peer play music ETF giving investors exposure to the entire music industry ecosystem, streaming content, live music and ticketing, equipment, satellite, and technology. Uh, Goldman Sachs just put out their report that the industry is doubling to 131 billion by 2030. Live music is on fire this summer. Uh, revenues are up from pre-pandemic levels 10 times, closing out at 40 billion. This was obviously a massive summer with tours between Taylor Swift and Beyonce and Springsteen and Harry Styles and Ed Sheeran. And people just can't get enough of live music. This was the summer of funflation, the summer of revenge spending. People have pricing power. They want experiences. They want to promote where they are on TikTok. This is the revenge of the super fan. The super fan today is out to spend money and out to experience live music. And our fund captures all that. It captures all the excitement, the growth and innovation between streaming, content, live music, radio, equipment, technology. We're here giving investors a front row seat to the music industry. So, David, let's let's talk about what your holdings are. Um, I'm surprised by some of these names. You've obviously got Apple, 
Amazon in their alphabet. But, you know, when we're talking about concerts, it's not somebody like necessarily like a live nation. I guess that's not one of your top holdings. How are you looking at sort of the investment landscape to see where the biggest returns are if you want to ride this funflation as you've characterized it? Right. Okay. So if you look at our fund, 35% of the holdings are streaming holdings. So we have 10 streaming companies. You won't, you've identified three out of seven. We also have Spotify. We have Cloud. We have Tencent. We have Click Digital. We have Genie Corp. We have Kakao. We have Live One. These are small cap, mid cap, and large cap names. Spotify is the largest player, obviously, of all the streaming companies at 200 million paid subs. But we had to include Apple, Amazon, and Google because that's another 200 million paid subscribers. Their holdings, by the way, are capped at 7%. So no single company on our, in our fund can be more than 7%. Second category of, of, uh, of, of companies in the fund are all content companies. We have 20 content companies in there. We have all the big names like Warner Music Group and Universal and Sony, but we have all the small, small and mid and large K-pop companies like Hive, JYP, SM Entertainment, Avex in Japan, Him, the largest content company in Taiwan. So we have companies around the world, small cap, mid cap, and large cap. Uh, you know, we have to include the big names because they are important players in music today. But really, that's only 20% of the fund. 80% are a lot of companies you haven't heard of before. 45% of the companies in our fund are domestic. 55% are company. We have companies uh, that are as small as a $100 million market cap that have average daily trading volume of 500,000 shares a day. Um, so we really give a, a big cross section in the live music side. That's 12% of our fund. We have names you're familiar with, like Live Nation, but we also have CTS Eventum and uh, Eventum and Vivid Seats and Madison Square Garden and Sphere and iHeart. Then we have all of the technology companies in the fund that are giving all the tools for artists to create tons of new music. So Dolby, Yamaha, uh, Focusrite, Sonos. These are all at the intersection of AI and innovation. AI is revolutionizing production right now. AI is revolutionizing creativity. This fund has all of the companies that are giving tools, producers, uh, tools to the producers and musicians and artists to create new tools. And then the last bucket is satellite and radio. We have companies like Town Square Media and, and, uh, and Sirius. So if you look, we have 50 holdings in our fund. Um, all of these companies give investors total exposure to the music industry ecosystem. If you love what you're seeing with any artist, chances are we have their label, we have their publishing company, we have royalty trust too, I forgot to mention, we have Reservoir and Hypnosis. So we really have, if you see all the excitement around music, pick any vertical, music publishing today, Katy Perry sold her catalog for $240 million. If you look at any vertical, we're capturing everything. This is a completely liquid way for investors to invest in the music industry. For years, they couldn't. They had to be an LP at Blackstone, KKR, Apollo. Their money was tied up for 10 years investing in these music companies. Now, for the first time, investors have a portable and convenient way to invest in the global music industry. All right, David, thank you so much for your time and insight there, sir. We appreciate it. Thank you. And coming up, it's closing time here on Yahoo Finance. We recap the top stories of the day and get you set for everything you need to know tomorrow. Stay tuned.
It is closing time here on Yahoo Finance. Let's take a look at some of the top stories from today. The UAW stand-up strike against the big three automakers rolled into its fourth day with not much movement in sight as both sides appear stuck at an impasse. Over 12,000 UAW workers have walked off and remain on strike as part of a coordinated plan that affected three separate plants. A major shakeup with tech giants is Panos Panay, an almost 20-year veteran who led Microsoft Windows team, has announced he's leaving the company. Panay served as general manager for Surface when the initial tablets were introduced back in 2012. He's now reportedly heading to Amazon to run the division responsible for the Alexa and Echo smart speakers. And U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen spoke on Monday, issuing no signs of an economic downturn. But she did warn that failure by Congress to pass legislation to keep the government running risked slowing momentum in the economy. And time now for what to watch on Tuesday. The Federal Reserve will kick off its FOMC meeting as investors eagerly await the latest interest rate decision. September's meeting comes following new economic data that showed easing core inflation in a cooling labor market. Investors expecting the Federal Open Market Committee to hold its benchmark interest rate steady. Meanwhile, on the real estate front, August data on housing starts and building permits are out at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. It's coming after U.S. single family home building and permits for future Future construction rising in July amid acute shortage of previously owned homes. And shifting gears to the auto space, the United Auto Workers Union will enter the fifth day of its strike on Tuesday. So far, no signs of a breakthrough in negotiations with the big three, Stellantis, GM, and Ford. Around 12,700 UAW workers have walked off and remain on strike as part of a coordinated plan that affected three separate plants. That does it for Josh and I on this Monday. We will be right back here tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern here at the New York Stock Exchange for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. See you tomorrow.